friends. Dear friends. Hello again, friends. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our dinner speaker, K.T. McFarland. K.T. is one of our favorite conservative leaders because she's brave and bold and a worker. We honored her a couple of years ago with our Claire Booth Luce Woman of the Year Award because of her courage, her leadership, her grace, her dedication to advancing conservative principles. She continues to inspire and encourage us with all of those traits. She's one of the most popular speakers among young people, certainly at the Luce Center. She's a great role model for our young women with a wonderful husband who we're so delighted to have with us tonight, Alan Robert McFarlane, there you go. They have five children, and they love to travel together. And KT, I'm jealous. I tried to convince my husband to come with me from Virginia. Some of you know my husband, Ron Robinson. And he said to me, I would love to see everyone, but you have to remember, I'm retired. <laughs> In addition to her fine husband and children, KT has an incredibly rich educational and professional experience. She worked her way through George Washington University, studying at the Elliott School of International Affairs, earning a BA in Chinese studies. Wow. Her job during her undergraduate study was the nighttime typing pool at the Nixon White House for the National Security Council, preparing President Nixon's daily brief. After working in the Ford administration, she earned a master's degree from Oxford University. She attended MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she studied nuclear weapons, China, and the Soviet Union. After President Reagan took office, she returned to Washington, first to work for Senator John Tower on the Senate Armed Services Committee, then as a speechwriter for U.S. Secretary of Defense, Caspar Weinberger. Next, she became deputy to the Assistant Secretary for Defense for Public Affairs, and then served as a Pentagon spokesman. You were a spokesman, not a spokeswoman, right? Yeah. I want the power. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then in 1985, she married Alan, and <laughs> took a break to raise their children, and she frequently drew comparisons between motherhood and government leadership. <laughs> she ran for the U.S. Senate in New York in 2006. We all talked about how awful Hillary Clinton was, but KT tried to beat her. Good for you. She did a tremendous amount of national security commentary on Fox News and other stations until she joined President Donald Trump's national security team. She was Deputy to National Security Advisor General Michael Flynn. After General Flynn was driven out, President Trump nominated KT to be ambassador to Singapore. But the deep state was after her, pressuring her to lie about things that went on, the president, the general, and eventually she withdrew her nomination. But I didn't lie. Let's make it clear, I didn't lie. She didn't lie. She did not. Unbelievable presser. You did leave the country, but... <laughs> <laughs> but that was smart. Went to a beautiful place just to get away from the crazies. She's great with our young women at the Luce Center, always staying to talk with the girls as long as they like after she makes a presentation. She's truly one of the most experienced and informed foreign policy experts in America. With the attacks on Israel, could our timing have been better? Please join me in welcoming KT McFarland.
<laughs> for those of you who don't know who this lady really is, does anybody know who Mr. Chips was? Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Okay, well, Michelle Easton is the female version of Mr. Chips because she has taken decades of young women who find it a very lonely place to be on college campuses if you're a conservative woman and you have traditional values, and she has made them proud to be conservative women on college campuses. And if anybody's looked at the last 72 hours how crazy college campuses have gotten, there is nobody better than Mrs. Chips here. Uh, I also want to thank you, Andrew, for what you do here. Um, I had the honor of working for President Reagan, and I'm of the generation who thinks everybody remembers President Reagan, but they don't. And what you do here to promote not just who he was, but the values, and particularly with the Reagan Ranch. Once you go to the Reagan Ranch, you get Ronald Reagan. You understand why he could be a man of extreme principles, no matter what was happening, is because he was grounded here. And so the fact that you continue to educate people of all ages, but particularly young people, I mean, maybe there's a little hope left in the country, because maybe some of it's going to steep in. What I wanted to do, well, what I was intending to do, was to talk to you about foreign policy, and I thought we'd do a little tour of the world, we'd do a little Ukraine, a little Russia, you know, glance over the Middle East, maybe talk about Europe, maybe China, but I think um, most people want to talk about the Middle East right now. So the way I've been trying to put it into, in my own head, to try to put it into context, because these things are all very closely related to each other, is, and I'd like you to think of three things, and I'm going to then talk about a lot of stuff, but remember these three things. Follow the money. It's now or never. And the third one, well, this is really, the third one is, it's, it's all about energy. It's all about oil. It's all about, follow the money means it's all about oil. And that is something Ronald Reagan understood. So let me go through the world, my tour of the world. When we started in the Trump administration, we understood that there was a unique historic moment, that because of fracking, we, the United States, would be able to be energy, not only energy independent, but energy dominant in the world. Now what that means is that we could use, we could, because of a lot of American ingenuity and engineers and horizontal drilling and fracking, um, 3D mapping, we could find oil and natural gas in rocks. And it turns out we have the best rocks of anybody in the world. So we understood that we could take the price of oil, which was, you know, in the Obama administration was probably about $100 a barrel, sort of very between $80 and $120 a barrel, that we could have American energy producers get oil at $40 a barrel. Our guys would make a profit. The bad guys would be bankrupt, right? Russia, all Russia does is export oil and natural gas. I mean, nobody buys Russian computers, right? Russian cars, it's Russian gas, Russian oil. And the same thing with Iran. We figured that that opportunity would be great for the American economy, but it would bankrupt the bad guys, and then it would start changing the constellations all over the world. So we understood that in the Middle East, Again, Saudi Arabia, not such a bad guy, but sometimes a bad guy. But Iran, particularly as the, the most dangerous country in the region and the sponsor of terrorism, that Iran would be bankrupt and then Iran would have to sue for peace. We also understood that the Saudis, particularly the younger generation of Saudis, um, who were not a whole lot older than you guys, I mean, they're in their early, you know, late 20s, early 30s, that they were very comfortable with Western, <clears throat> with, they'd have been educated in the West, they were comfortable with open societies, open economies, and we knew if we could convince them that they could never count on oil to pay for their societies, that they would come to the realization that they had to diversify their economies, open up their societies, and how do you do that? Sue for peace with Israel. That was the crux of the Abraham Accords. And so throughout the Trump administration, as we saw the price of oil go down, 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 down. I mean, does anybody remember, maybe not in California, but other places in the country. We, I mean, we were, had a buck 50 gallon of gas, you know? It was amazing. So it was terrific for our economy. But the other, the Arab countries started realizing we've got to sue for peace with Israel. And that was the beginning of the Abraham Accords. 
we, uh, there were peace agreements between Israel and several of the Arab countries, Arab Sunni countries in the Gulf. We knew the final peace would be Saudi Arabia. That if we could have Israeli-Saudi peace, you would have peace in the Middle East. Because you would have the Sunnis and the Arabs. So Arabs are not Iranians. Iranians are Persians. And Arabs are Arabs. And they don't like each other. They racially don't like each other. They don't like each other religiously either because the Saudis... And all the Gulf Arabs are Sunni and the and Iran is Shiite. And that's like the Catholics and the Protestants in Northern Ireland. They don't like each other either. So we figured that if we could get Arab-Israeli peace, Iran is bankrupt, the, Arabs, the Arab countries would stop supporting the lethal poison of Hamas and Hezbollah, and that we could perceive to have peace in the Middle East. Plus, we wouldn't need to be in the middle of their sort of chaotic, you know, they've been fighting with each other for 2,000 years. We would not be in the middle of that. We had our own oil. So we understood that was how we were going to deal with the Middle East. We also thought of how do you deal with Russia. Well, Russia, historically, Soviet Union before Russia, Russia was, every time oil prices went up, and you can go back and you can look at the, you know, the 50s, the 70s, the 80s, when oil prices were high, Russia rebuilt its military, it invaded its neighbors, and it had proxy wars around the world. Every time oil prices were low, the Russian Soviet Union before had to like hunker down to feed their own people. So we also realized that if we, again, using American technology, ingenuity, and the good rocks, that we could have low oil prices, we would bankrupt Russia. So Russia couldn't get in any trouble. Russia couldn't invade its neighbors. It couldn't have proxy wars. So that was how we set out at the beginning of the Trump administration. Bankrupt the bad guys, fix the American economy, peace in the Middle East, probably peace in a lot of other places. When the Biden administration came in, they saw the world differently and they flipped the script again. So they stopped the American energy production, this Biden's war on fossil fuels, and as a simple supply and demand, duh, uh, less oil, natural gas, price goes up, bad guys get rich, our economy isn't very good. So once the bad guys started getting money, Russia, Iran, they started looking for bad things to do. So that's when the Russians were able to invade Ukraine. They had the money to do it. And that's when Iran started building up Hezbollah and Hamas. At the end of the first, well, the Trump administration, Iran was so broke that they stopped funding Hamas. And we knew it was only a matter of time before Iran would have to, to come to the peace table in some fashion. So that's follow the money and follow the oil. Then th the next part of what I want to talk to you about is how things are so different now and how countries are concluding that nothing left to lose. The time is now. Time is running out. So who's in this calculation? I think Iran, well, I think Russia first. Russia looked at, at Ukraine, always had its eye on Ukraine. It was always unfinished business. The Russians had invaded in the Obama administration, um, in the George W. George W. Bush administration. They sort of grabbed a little bit more of Ukraine and Georgia and other places, and they thought, well, we'll go. Oil prices are high again. Thank you, Joe Biden. And so they launched their invasion of Ukraine, thinking it would be done very quickly, and they would have they would be have a pro-Russian government in Ukraine. That didn't happen, and. So where are we now with Russia? Where are we now with Ukraine? Russians can fight forever. As long as that price of oil is above $80 a barrel, the Russians can keep fighting the war. Now, they're running out of weapons, but they've got the money to buy the weapons elsewhere, North Korea, Iran, wherever. They can fight forever. They may not fight to win, but they're not going to lose because Vladimir Putin, who is not very good at many things, he's lousy at, a, at getting a good economy for his country, He's been, I think, pretty bad in a lot of ways with his foreign policy, but he's terrific at staying in power. So he has figured out that if he goes home, he cannot, that this sort of dream that the Biden people have and the, and the left has, of, well, yeah, Vladimir Putin is going to leave and kumbaya is going to happen, or they think Vladimir Putin is going to get overthrown and the guy who replaces Vladimir Putin will sue for peace. They don't understand Russia. Vladimir Putin is a dead man walking if he does not do something in Ukraine, spin it somehow. So he does not, he, he's got the money, 
and he's got the motivation, he's going to stay in Ukraine as long as he can, no matter what the outcome is. So I think for Putin, he understood that it was now or never for him. So he had the money. He had the incentive, because as he could see, Ukraine was starting to move closer to the West. There was talk that Ukraine would join NATO, European Union. I think Putin figured, it's now or never. I've got a weak American president who's stopped American energy production, who's allowed me to have um, everything I want in the energy business, has even said that I could, as long as I didn't go after the top 17 things with cyber warfare, if I went into 18, 19, or 20, it would be okay. So I think that's why Vladimir Putin made his move. Now let's go to Iran. Iran is looking at the situation in the Middle East. Everybody had looked at Afghanistan two years ago and realized, oh, America, they made a big mistake, they made a big strategic mistake. But the one thing most countries in the world had thought of prior to Afghanistan, that America makes mistakes, sure, sure, sure. But the one thing America is really good at is logistics and organization. And Afghanistan showed we were really bad at both. So we left, not only did we leave, not only did we leave in such a shambolic fashion that the Taliban could immediately come in and take the most critical, I mean, the best military air base in, in Asia, really, but that they would all of a sudden be one of the most well-equipped armies and militaries in the world because we left all the stuff. that We didn't even blow the stuff up as we left. We just left it. So Afghanistan now, again, follow the money. Afghanistan is selling. You're seeing Afghanistan weapons all over the place. We think we saw them 72 hours ago with Hamas. We think that they were, had bought weapons from Afghanistan and they were using them there. We know they're using them in Ukraine and we know they'll continue. There's a lot of American stuff they can sell. But to get back to what is Iran's motivation in all of this and why follow the money, no time like now, all about energy. Iran looks at what had happened in the Middle East in the Abraham Accords. They couldn't stop it, but they saw it happening. And they saw the writing on the wall. And then about three weeks ago, maybe now four weeks ago, um, my colleague at Fox News, Brett Baer, had a back-to-back -back interviews with the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, and with Bibi Netanyahu. And they both said, we are very close to a peace agreement. So Israel, so the final piece of the Trump-Abraham Accords was about to happen. Israel was going to make peace with the Saudis. And it wasn't just peace like we're not going to shoot each other. It was an economic watershed. Because the plan was that there would be super highways built. There would be trade routes that would come from Europe to the Middle East. They would go through Israel and then to the Arab countries and then to India. It was all set. And the, Iran looks at that and says, that happens and we're done. We're not diversifying our economies. The only way we stay in power is death to Israel, death to America. So they, they look at that and think, we are weeks away <clears throat> from having peace in the Middle East that we're not part of. And they also understood, they're not stupid, they understood that an a, a economic agreement between Israel and the Arab countries would be massively um, beneficial and, pro and make both, both Arabs and the Israelis prosperous be beyond all belief. Because trade then could go, prior to this, trade could not go, you could not trade between Israel and an Arab country. You couldn't fly an airplane between Israel and an Arab country. So the Europeans, if they wanted to enter the Middle East market, they couldn't go through Israel, which was the natural place, and then to the Arab countries. They had to do this convoluted around to go. So the Iranians look at this and they think, Yikes, time is running out. It's now or never. We've got the money. Thank you, Joe Biden, for high energy prices. We've, for the last several years, have really been resupplying, because of those extra funds we have, we've really been resupplying Hamas and Hezbollah. And we've got an administration that somehow just seems to love Iran. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, to me, it's just beyond belief that the Obama and the Biden administration have this sort of unrequited love affair with Iran, and they keep chasing Iran, saying, make a deal with us, here's this, here's that goodie, do this, do that. And then the Iran just says, give me a little more, they slap them away, they come back. But Iran's figuring it's never going to be this good. And they particularly realize that if the administration were to change and a Republican of any variety comes in, that's not going to be the case. You know, the Obama administration and the Biden administration were anti-Israel. They won't say they were, but they acted that way, and they were pro-Iranian. And Iran couldn't count on that. So for Iran, time was running out. They had to make their move, and so they did. 
Now, why did they do what they did? And oh, by the way, anybody who gets on and, and tells you, oh, this was not Iran, we don't have proof that it was Iran. You know, I mean, we know that they've been supplying them with weapons and training and financial assistance, but we don't really think it was Iran. That's just such baloney. <laughs> and they're doing that because they're covering themselves. Because, you know, the, the Biden people, they know they screwed up. But they're not going to come out and say, oh, you know, we made such a huge mistake on Iran, we're going to change. They're not going to. They're doubling down. And so that's why you're hearing all these Iran apologists come out of the Biden administration to give all sorts of reasons why it couldn't have been Iran. Although the Wall Street Journal had a very, had a very well-sourced reporting saying that there were meetings in Beirut between the Iranians and the four terrorist groups um, you know, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Palestine Liberation Front, et cetera, a couple of weeks ago, and that this was pretty well orchestrated. Nobody thinks that Hamas, by the way, which are, they're kind of the hillbilly thugs of, of that part of the world. They're not, they don't plan stuff like this. It's a pretty sophisticated operation, even though it was low tech. But they couldn't have planned, they certainly wouldn't have had the operational security that, that had to be necessary for this surprise attack. So Iran unleashes Hamas. What does Hamas do? They don't do what they normally do. Normally when Hamas or Hezbollah has lobbed missiles into Israel, you know, they go for military sites, they go for bunkers, they go for arms depots, they go for infrastructure. They don't go for women and children. And this was very deliberately targeted to the slaughter of the innocents. It was grandmothers, it was women, it was children, it was bad. I don't even want to think about the pictures that hopefully none of you have looked at, but I have, and it's just... That they went there deliberately. Why? They knew they weren't going to win against Israel. But they wanted the civilian casualties. It made them feel good. You know, they could kill some Jews, kill some Israelis. They felt good about it. But what Iran wants to do is isolate Israel. For the very reason I said before, that Israel was making peace with all these Arab countries. It was going to be economic prosperity. Iran needed to not only screw that deal up, but they needed to isolate Israel. So what better way than to have Israel be in a position where it has to respond, and it has to go into Gaza, it has to wipe out Hamas, and then even though the, even though the country in the world for the last five days has been horrified at what Hamas has done, and has been very much with Israel in their minds, and even President Biden came out twice and gave very strong statements, Israel, we're behind you, we have your back. Let's fast forward about a week or two when there are going to be very large civilian casualties in Gaza. There are large civilian casualties because these brave Hamas fighters make sure that they put the women and children in front of them. I mean, they use their own children and wives and grannies as human shields. They want those civilian casualties. So in two weeks' time, you're going to have a public opinion in the world that flips and changes. And you're going to start seeing countries saying, well, Israel, you've gone too far. Um, it's not, it's not what, you're, what you're doing is really bad. It's not, it's not reciprocal. It, it's, you're bad. And then the worry I have is that in two weeks' time, you have a Biden administration that does three things. They stop sharing the intelligence, which is very important. We have really good satellite intelligence that we can share with Israel. They're going to stop and slow walk the resupply of weapons. And there's going to be diplomatic hesitation. So you're going to start hearing... From the Obama administration, from the Biden administration, same thing. It's actually, it is exactly the same people. You are going to start hearing things like, well, Israel, you're being too heavy-handed with this, et cetera, et cetera. Normally, when these things happen in the Middle East, you know, I mean, Iran supplies missiles to Hezbollah and Hamas, and when they get a good enough stockpile, they start shooting them over to Israel. Mostly they hit the desert, but occasionally they have some casualties. And then Israel says, okay, we're going to go in. And they actually call it mowing the grass. Um, they go in and they take out the arms depots in Gaza or in Lebanon and where Hamas, I mean Hezbollah is in the north. And then they don't, they don't kill off everybody, but they just come back. And then they know they're going to have to go back in about five years and mow the grass again. This is different. Israel is not going to mow the grass this time. I mean, Israel is going to scorch earth. And they, they are going to go and they're going to wipe out Hamas, the civilian leadership, and the military leadership, and the arms depots, and there are going to be large civilian casualties. And the worry I have is, again, I'm like, I'm like five steps ahead of this, thinking what could go wrong, what could go wrong. I'm a defense planner at MIT. I got my, my degrees of learning how to 
prepare for nuclear war and what could go wrong. So I'm looking at what could go wrong. So if Israel, let's say a month from now, feels isolated, doesn't, America does not have Israel's back, what could Israel do? They could think, running out of time. It's now or never. And then Israel might conclude, realistically, what has Hamas just done with Iran's goading? Slaughter of the innocents. What about a nuclear Iran? Would a nuclear Iran hesitate to use nuclear weapons on Israel? If they thought to that, no, they would not have. So Israel could well conclude, now or never, never again. We promise ourselves never again. And if they don't feel they have the backing of the United States and the American president, then Israel might conclude, okay, it's time to go after those nuclear sites in Iran. Israel has shown in the past, very effectively, when it's gone after Syrian uh, nuclear weapons enrichment plant in, in Syria and in, in Libya, they have no problem going in. They don't claim credit for it. They just do it. They've also targeted Iranian nuclear scientists in the last several, last five, ten years. They have no problem doing that. If Israel concludes nobody's got its back, then I worry that we then see the next, which Israel will have to do to go in and, and destroy the Iran nuclear sites, and then you have a bigger, you have a, you know, potential nuclear consequences. If Israel doesn't do that, is anybody going to stop Iran's nuclear program? You know, when in this Brett Baer interview, Brett asked the um, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, well, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, what about you? And without missing a beat, he said, well, we've got to get nuclear weapons too. Now, in the good old days, when I studied and taught nuclear weapons at MIT, you had to kind of make your own nuclear weapons. Countries made their own. Um, they got their own uranium. They enriched it. They got the missiles. You need three things for a nuke. You need uranium. You, don't, you need enriched uranium. You need a missile to deliver it. And you need a blueprint to pull it all together. We know Iran has the enriched uranium. We know they have the missiles. They've tested them. Do they have the blueprint? Not so sure, but probably not too far away. So if Iran gets nuclear weapons, the Saudis, they're not going to build them from scratch. They're going to buy them. And they'll buy nuclear weapons from Pakistan. They'll buy nuclear weapons from North Korea. And you could have a nuclear arms I mean, a year from now, you could have a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, which is a part of the world that they shouldn't even be playing with matches. You know, <laughs> they could have nuclear weapons. So let's now go a little further. So my worry is that our support for the state of Israel flags during this period. That's why it's so important for everybody here who has any voice at all with political leaders, make sure that the Biden administration keeps to what it says it's going to do, which is to stand by Israel. But let's move along. <laughs> let's go to China. So again, China, you know, no time like now. May never have this opportunity again. Follow the money. It's all about energy. So China, which um, probably not Reagan, but everybody else in the last 20 or 30 years has looked at China and said, well, you know, we're going to help them modernize. My old boss, Henry Kissinger, was probably the leader of this school of thought. We're going to help them modernize. They're going to have an open economy, an open society. And they'll be trading partners with us, competitors, but not enemies. And look what happened to Germany after World War II or Japan. This is a well-worn path. And it really wasn't a bad idea. It wasn't a bad bet. And Republicans and Democrats, everybody agreed that's how you treat China. Oddly enough, the Chinese didn't believe this. So the Chinese looked at the foolish Americans. And they said, OK, fine. You know, give us these favorable trade agreements. You know, we, um, we'll get into the World Trade Organization. You're going to give us great tariff arrangements so that you know, you won't charge any tariffs for our goods, and we'll charge big tariffs on your goods. It'll develop our economies, et cetera, et cetera. But the Chinese figured their plan was not our plan. And in fact, secretly, they were writing their plan. Their plan was made in China, 2025. That was the Chinese plan to take the 10 critical technologies of the future, quantum engineering, quantum computing, robotics, AI, and that China would beg, borrow, steal, somehow become the leader in all these tech manufacturing of all these technologies. And then China control the technologies of the future, you control the future. 
They also have something called AI 2030. And by 2030, they plan to have enough the capability in quantum computing to, and artificial intelligence that then they really control the future. Now, at the same time, the Chinese were building up their military. And it, they, they started from nothing. But they've now got what's called a blue water navy, and military, and particularly a navy, that has the capability of really being worldwide. So the China plan is that they want to push the United States out of the South China Sea out of the Western Pacific and push us all the way back to Hawaii. Now, why does that matter? Well, it's because that's the world's most important trade route, maritime trade route. All the trade that's going to and from China, to and from Japan, to and from um, the South, South Asia, it all goes through the same trade route. And if China's the country that is deciding, OK, yes, this ship, no, that ship, China then controls the most important maritime trade route. And that's China's plan. I mean, it's taken us a long time to wake up to it. And I think one of Donald Trump's greatest achievements was that he's brought that. I mean, remember when, maybe you guys don't remember, you kids, but old folks like us. In 2020, Joe Biden was saying, China, they're good guys. They're our friends. And Trump was saying, China, China, China. <laughs> but I do think that the whole country has, and the world has sort of woken up to what the Chinese threat is. So how do you deal with all that stuff? Well, guess who has the lousiest energy situation in the world? China. They have dirty coal, but they don't have anything. They don't have these good rocks that we do. And they don't have oil. They don't have natural gas. They have to import energy. They'll import it from anybody. They're terrifically happy now because they've cut these deals with Iran, which had been sanctioned. They've cut, they're buying Iranian oil, Russian oil, $30 a barrel. So China's happy as could be with these conflicts because they're getting cheap energy. But if the United States did start reproducing, I mean, start producing again oil and natural gas, we could, we have enough oil and natural gas to power the world for 200 years. We could be the Middle East. We could be the world's energy source. And it would be clean, and it would be cheap, and it would be safe, and it would be abundant. And China understands that. So that's one way of dealing with China. The other thing we should do is fix the American economy, and then we fix American technology. But anyway, those are sort of, we can get in the weeds later. But I would conclude by saying that, especially in a building, and people who know about Ronald Reagan and dedicated to Ronald Reagan, the great genius of Reagan um, was he was presented with the Soviet Union which was a bigger threat in our eyes at the time than China and Russia and everybody all together. And Reagan was basically said, well, what's your plan? With, you know, you're just a cowboy from Santa Barbara. <laughs> what do you know about fixing? How, do you, how are you going to deal with the Cold War? And he says, simple, we're going to win. <laughs> so, so and then he turned to his staff and said, you guys figure it out. <laughs> but the, Reagan was presented, and the conventional wisdom at the time was you had two choices. You could either live in this perpetual Cold War with a nuclear trigger at each other's head, or you'd have World War III. Those were your only two options. So Reagan said, no, I don't like those. I want a third option. And his third option was follow the money. <laughs> no time like now. And it's all about energy. So Reagan understood, you bankrupt the Soviet Union. How do you bankrupt the Soviet Union? Reagan took, he said there was this guy, General Vernon Walters, he was this big, gruff old guy. He was like 70 or 80 years old at the time. I thought he was like Methuselah, he was so old. And so we sent General Vernon Walters, who knew the king of Saudi Arabia from the good old days in the desert and on the camels. And he goes into the desert and he says to the king, we would like you to pump oil. It's not going to be for your economic advantage, but you don't care about the money, but we will be, America will be your friend forever. So the king of Saudi Arabia did just that. He started pumping oil. Oil went from $40 a barrel to $18 a barrel in nine months. You're the Soviet Union. You've just seen your income stream be cut in half. In addition to that, there were other economic problems that we helped. You know, Reagan understood that eventually the Soviet Union would collapse, but our plan was just hurry it along, hurry it along. And that's exactly what he did. So Reagan found that third option in the middle. We're not going to fight them. We're not going to live this dangerous Cold War. We're certainly not going to have, we're not going to concede victory to the Soviet Union. We're going to bankrupt them. And that's how we won the Cold War. Guess what we could do today? Same plan. 
bankrupt Russia, bankrupt Iran. Use American energy sources, and then we're in a very, we have a very different 21st century than the one I think we're looking at right now. So I probably talked, if I talked way too long, uh, can I just tell one terrific Reagan story as long as I'm right here? Um, one of the ways that we dealt with the Soviet Union was obviously the bankrupt them, but the other way was we met, we met them, the Soviet Union had had a big military buildup in the in the 70s after we left Vietnam. Remember, oil prices were high, Russia, Soviet Union built up. And so we knew that we had to match them, so we had the Reagan defense build up. Okay, so we meet them on that scale, we kind of checkmate them on that. We cut off their ability to have technology from the United States. Does this sound like a familiar conversation about China? Anyway, so we had technology transfer. We wouldn't, the Russians didn't even have Xerox machines. So we made sure they never got Xerox machines. And then we talked, we had the international banking community. Was, Russia wasn't really in the international economic system, but they borrowed money from American banks. So we made sure they weren't going to be able to borrow any money. And then $40 a barrel, $18 a barrel, income cut in half, Soviet Union's broke. And then Reagan uh, gave the Star Wars speech. And I had the amazing honor of my life was I, I wrote the first draft. And some of the great words that Reagan, yay. <laughs> um, I did not do the hard, I mean, Reagan did the brilliant part, which is a missile defense shield. But when President, and it was all kept very quiet because President Reagan didn't want anybody in the bureaucracy to, you know, to kind of squish it, throw sand in the gears. So it was all very, kept very quiet. There were only... A couple of people at the Pentagon, probably one guy at the State Department, a few people on the National Security Council, and then President Reagan, and the scientists who worked for President Reagan. So President Reagan came up with this idea we would have a missile shield, that we didn't know how to do it, but we probably could do it. We knew we had some critical technologies that we could. It may take us 20 years, but wouldn't that be great if we had a world free of nuclear weapons? So, the, so President Reagan gave this speech on March 23, 1983, and I was invited to be in the Oval Office while he gave the speech to the American people. And then President Reagan had invited about 20 nuclear scientists to be in the West Wing of the White House to talk about it afterwards. And it was the most incredible night because there were, there were scientists, there were some, some of my professors from MIT, but they talked, they knew about laser technology, they knew about miniaturization, satellite, how to put things in satellites, and they, none of them had ever really put it all together. And so they sat in the East Room of the White House, and Reagan, you know, said half cookies and jelly beans, or just sit around here and hang, hang out for a while. And they all started talking to each other, and they realized, well, we don't know how to do this, but we think we have an idea of how we might do this. And it might take, it might take 10 years, it might take 20. While we're doing this in the West Wing of the White House, the Soviet Union was going nuts because they realized we're broke. We're already spending far more of our GNP on our military than we thought we, we, than we can and can we afford. And now this crazy guy, Reagan, has challenged us to a nuclear arms race in space, a missile defense shield. We know we can't do it. We have to concede. It's done. We've got to go to the negotiating table. We can't even feed our people. So I just think that if we could only bring more and more people here and they could understand how Reagan won the Cold War without firing a shot, Reestablish America's love and faith in itself and fixed our economy. It's the blueprint is there. We just have to do it all over again. If everybody's, are you guys want to go home or do you want to do some questions? Okay, let's do some Q&A. I can talk forever. If so, um, Okay, anybody want to ask a question? We have floating microphones that come around. Um, you have to raise your hand up. You might even have to stand up to get a mic. Okay, there's a nice looking man right here with a yellow tie. Yeah, it's yellow. <laughs> so the clown show in Washington. The what clown show? The clown show. <laughs> You're being so nice. I would have called it something else. They, they want us to believe that we have to keep sending money to the Ukraine yeah. because if Ukraine, if Russia takes Ukraine, then they're going to take Poland and then they're going to take Lithuania. And I believe that's a false narrative, but no one seems to discuss it in the media. 
I think Russia, we need, Putin is not going to lose, just as you said. And we need, we need a peace. We need to have a peace treaty. Ukraine's not going to win. No. So here's how you deal with that. And again, two options, right? We either give a blank check to Ukraine, one of the most corrupt countries in the world, to keep fighting, or we pull out and we let Russia do whatever Russia's going to do. I mean, I don't think it, I don't believe in the domino theory in Europe, but anyway, we don't really want Russia to have Ukraine. So I think you do the Reagan thing. You do the third way. You bankrupt Russia. If the price of oil... So, so in, Alan and I live in New York, and we were sitting at a dinner this summer with a man who's, I guess his company, he's like a gazillion billionaire, and he's, he's got the biggest oil distribution company in the country. And I said, you know, I've got this idea that if we could only um, decide that we were going to go back to the old Reagan slash Trump policies of producing American oil and natural gas again, it would be a really great thing, right? It would drive the price of down and a, a price of oil down in a couple of years because it would take us so long to build liquefied natural gas terminals. It would, you know, we'd have to ramp up. And he said, "Oh no, no, you don't understand. Oil is a commodity, and that's a futures market." He said, "If a, a president came in and said, okay, we promise you, bankers." We're going to be favorable. We're going to let the leases. We're going to um, let federal lands be open to leases again. We're not going to. We're going to take all these regulations that the that the Biden administration has put on production of oil and natural gas. We're going to stop them. We're going to build liquefied natural gas terminals to send LNG to Europe. He said, if if an administration and presidents did that, he said the price would change in six months. You would drive that price in half in six months. So that's how I would solve Ukraine. Now I don't think Ukraine can win the war. I don't think Russia can really win the war, but there's only one country that can win the peace. And the one thing Reagan taught everybody that hopefully a few people still remember is you play the long game. You don't do it for the next election, the next news cycle. You play the long game. And the long game in Ukraine would be, OK, push those oil prices down in six months' time. Russia's bankrupt. It knows it can't continue to fight the way it has. The fighting stops. What happens? I mean, anybody here, investors or bankers? OK. There's a trillion dollars that's going to go rush into Ukraine. Not rush up, but you know, run into Ukraine to invest in Ukraine. After the fighting stops, Ukraine can win the peace. Because if all that money comes from the West, goes into Ukraine, very resource rich, agricultural rich, then you would start having an integrated Ukrainian economy with the European economy and the Western economy probably get NATO membership before too long. So five years after the peace agreement of some sort with Ukraine, and again, nobody's going to get everything. Ukraine isn't going to win. Russia's not going to win. Everybody gets a little bit enough to live with, but not what they all they want. But five years after the fighting stops, you could have Ukraine be a fully integrated and prosperous country in the heart of Europe. Fast forward to five years after the fighting stops, who's going to invest in Russia? Pariah nation, no rule of law, energy prices are low. Russia's broke five years after. So I play the long game. The immediate game is to bankrupt Russia. The long game is to have Ukraine be integrated with Europe. And then, you know, again, you want to fight these wars and win them, but you don't want to have to fire a shot of your own. Okay, shout, and I'll repeat. Your last, your last option regarding uh, what Israel may be faced with. Yeah. Uh, there's been one verse in the Biden administration's explanation of our fleet in the Mediterranean. Yes. And some commentators, when they hear the term, that's there to provide assurances that no one takes advantage of the situation. Have interpreted that to mean it's an implicit threat to Israel mm. not to go to Iran. Mm -hmm. And that's what's keeping uh, the process of decapitating the head. Do you think that's I, you know, okay, so did everybody hear what he said? And, and all right, so. The United States, so Biden has said, Israel, we've got your back. But we have one carrier, which is already in the Med, and now we're sending a second one. 
And the, the rationale that President Biden has given and his speeches and the Defense Department is briefing, he says, well, we want these carriers here to deter other countries from taking advantage of the situation, i.e. Hezbollah. And Hezbollah, far more sophisticated, much longer, much better quality of uh, missiles. That's the military that, you know, if the Hamas is a sort of, you know, hillbilly thugs, Hezbollah, they're the really tough ones. I mean, they've been fighting this war since the Reagan administration. Um, supposedly, the Biden administration has said, we're putting those carriers there to deter anyone from taking advantage. And it's been interpreted to mean, well, that's because they don't want Hezbollah in the north to enter and, and make it a two-front war. One other version is that we have those carriers in the Gulf to prevent, to encourage Israel to be more modest in their ambitions with Hezbollah. I think that there's a third reason, which is to evacuate Americans. We have Americans in Gaza. We don't know how we're getting them out of there. We have aid workers. Supposedly, we're talking to Egypt about getting Americans out of Gaza through Egypt. Not clear that that's been very successful. But we have a lot of American citizens who are, think Afghanistan, right? We have aid workers there. How are they going to get out? And we have an enormous number of American dual citizens, especially in Israel right now. And most American airline carriers have cut flights. They're not, we're not flying to get people out of Israel. In fact, one way that is Americans are getting out of Israel, oddly enough, is flying on Emirates Air, which thanks to the Abraham Accords, we do have a, they do have an agreement to fly Emirates from Israel to other places in the, in the Gulf, that Americans are getting on those planes on Emirates and they're getting to wherever they're getting, and then they're getting back to the United States. The other thing, which I think is just reprehensible, is that the Biden administration says, well, if we're going to take anybody out on American aircraft, you have to sign a voucher that you're going to have to pay us back. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, do I really think that we're... I don't think America wants to go to war on behalf of Israel, and I don't think Israel wants America. I mean, Israel has always said throughout its history, you give us what we need, and we will fight by ourselves, for ourselves. We will defend ourselves. We don't want your troops. We want your intelligence. We want your diplomatic support. We want your weapons. We want your money. But we don't want your troops. So, um, you know, your guess is as good as mine. I don't know where this goes in two weeks. I mean, good world. Israel goes in. It takes out the Hamas leadership. It doesn't just mow the lawn. It absolutely obliterates Hamas. But a bad place this goes is Hezbollah enters the front from the north. Then Israel, and then Israel is going to have a two-front war. Remember, the Israeli army, which is always, we always think of them as really good, and they are really good. But their officer corps has not fought a war in years. They're not experienced fighters. And their 350,000 reservists that they've called up, I mean, this is doctors, school teachers, lawyers. They're not, I mean, they're not really war, war veterans. And so I think Israel is going to have a harder job. And the job that they're going to have in, in Gaza, I mean, I've seen those. I've been in those tunnels. You know, you think a tunnel. You think, oh, like they're crawling on their stomachs, like, you know, World War II guys escaping from the gulags. Uh, no, the, the tunnels, think Holland Tunnel. These are tunnels that have trucks and tanks. They, they're, they're cement, the, the all the cement that we've been giving Gaza over the years, they're not building roads and schools. They're building tunnels. So it is going to be a really hard fight for the Israeli military to go door to door to door looking for bad guys and trying to find the hostages. My guess is that they took so many children as hostages because Iran, they looked at Iran and said, Jesus, Iran, you guys got a, mil a billion dollars per American. Let's take a bunch of American hostages in Israel, I mean, in Gaza. Let's think of how much we can get for them. So, I don't know. I mean, I hope to God that's not what those aircraft carriers are there for, but maybe. Yes. Yeah, okay, so... what? No, they're not going to do another carrier, but they might use the carriers to, like a special forces group that would go off of a carrier, go and try to find American hostages and bring them back, or an amphib group. But I don't think that anybody, including Israel, wants American troops or American military fighting in that war. Israel doesn't want it. Israel doesn't need it. Hi. Oh, 
Thank you. Could you please speak to the security and intelligence nightmare of one of the lesser knowns in the uh, current administration? You're talking uh, about Rob Malley? Rob Malley, Oof. yes. OK, so <laughs> there's this guy. <laughs> Um, and when I, in, the tr in the transition, so I was in the transition for Obama to Trump. And normally in a transition of one administration to the other, you know, you don't really like each other, but you at least cooperate. So the outgoing guys give you the list of here's what we're doing. Um, here, and you, and you, so you're supposed to have some kind of a seamless transition into the new administration. Well, there's this one guy that I met with in the White House in the National Security Advisor's office. So... I was going in, I met my counterpart, et cetera. And the guy was, he just was a really dodgy looking guy. And one of the things I asked, and he sort of, he was kind of not clear what his job was. It was like Middle East. And so one of the things I asked was, you guys are giving all this money to Iraq and these various groups in Iraq and Afghanistan. What's your metric for success? How are you judging whether these were good investments? And the answer kept coming back from Susan Rice and this guy, Rob Malley. Well, we're giving all this money. And I said, I know. <laughs> but is it successful? I mean, how are you showing your progress here? And they just looked at me like I was nuts. I mean, their answer was we're giving it money. But there was one guy who, who was in charge of Iran, and this was this guy, Rob Malley. And he's just, he, you know, what? I don't know. I shouldn't really say this. But, you know, if you meet someone, you look at them in the eye, right? This guy was looking at the floor the whole time. And he, it turns out... He was the chief negotiator for the Obama administration for the Iran nuclear deal. And by the way, the Iran nuclear deal wasn't an Iran nuclear deal at all. It was, it was not to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons. It was to allow Iran to get nuclear weapons just a little bit down the road, but legally get nuclear weapons. So it was a fraud from the get-go. But the same guy, so he was in the Obama administration, then during the Trump administration, we put the sanctions on Iran, and we drove the price of oil down, we moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I mean, the Abraham Accords, the Middle East was really going well. This guy was continuing to talk to Iran. He was also part of a group of American scholars who would write about Iran. They would write editorials about, oh, Iran is good, you know, good guys, blah, blah. And it turns out they were getting a lot of their instructions from the Iranian foreign minister. So fast forward, Biden administration, they want to talk about the Iran nuclear deal again. Who do they send? That guy wouldn't look, you know, kept looking at the floor. And Rob Malley is his name. Well, he has now been, his security clearance, he was State Department guy. He was the chief negotiator for the Iran nuclear deal. His security clearances, and he had the highest ones, have been revoked, or at least suspended. He is under investigation. He is not actively, uh, he, I mean, I think, I leave without pay, who knows? I think he's probably teaching at Harvard, of course. Um, <laughs> but uh, the talk is that he was passing classified information to the Iranians during the negotiations. And that he then has his little acolytes that have been salted in various places in the, in the Defense Department, I think somebody in the State Department, somebody somewhere else. And these guys, and we now have the, the emails that they were sending, or WhatsApp conversations they were sending to the Iranian foreign minister. And they were saying, you know, they wanted to check their talking points with the Iranian foreign minister. These guys were paying for it, the American government. I, it, to me, you know, talk about a two-tiered system of justice. Why is nobody looking at this guy? To me, that's treason, you know? classified information, giving it to the adversary and the enemy during a negotiation over nuclear weapons, doesn't get any bad, you know, it's just about as bad as it gets. But anyway, that's the Biden administration. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, thinking about uh, recent reports on news that Israel has given fair warning to the people of Gaza to leave to protect themselves. I mean, Hasmar's leaders will also leave. So the question is, so Israel has said to the people in Gaza, leave, you know, get out of here, we're coming in here, they'll probably start moving the tanks, you know, they'll probably come in the next 72 hours. So they've told to the people of Gaza, civilians, Get out of the way, you know, Hamas. If you're, if you're not in Hamas, get out of there. We're coming in. The problem is that the civilian leadership of Hamas, they're not even there. They're in Qatar. They're living in, you know, I don't know, good, probably four-star hotels. 
<laughs> on the money that President Obama's given them <laughs> and President Biden's given them. So, yeah, I mean, they're not leaving their own people. The, you know, the Hamas has said to the, to the Palestinians, don't leave, stay here, it's all going to be good. It's not going to be good. But again, flip the, flip the script. They don't want to save their people. Their people are human shields. Their people are expendable. Iran certainly thinks they're expendable. And they are going to be used in the greater cause of trying to isolate Israel. Ma'am? Hi. Hi. Jews have always been the canary in the oh, coal mine. Okay. Thank you. Um, when you talk about the blueprint, it's never going to be done because we know that the plan for Iran done by President Obama was part of his transformation, and Biden is going to complete it. They have never, Biden has never saved any of the Americans that were left in Afghanistan. Correct. And the belief now is he's not going to save anyone in Israel and that includes the Americans. So I have to agree with Dan Bongino. First they come for the people on Saturday, then they come for the people on Sunday. If there is any sympathy showed for the people of Gaza, I'm sorry, it is wrong. They're gonna start the sympathy. The people of Gaza voted for Hamas. 40 to 60% yeah. voted. If Israel does not destroy them, it will happen again, and it will be here in America. What they did was the Holocaust to us. Yeah. The reason, and what you, there's a, a lot of truth in what you say, and what concerns, and actually what President Trump was saying to a couple of us um, a few days ago, was that he's worried that with the open southern border, you don't know who's here. I mean, they're young military-age males. And we're long past the point where there are families from Central America looking for economic opportunities. And if there are a million and a half gotaways, and you already know that the ones that you got, there are people on the terror watch list. And just the law of large numbers and percentages, you got to assume that in that group there are people who are coming here to do malign activities. That's one of the reasons I, and I'm sure others, are very concerned of what happens in the United States in the coming weeks. You know, every mosque better be, I mean, every, um, <laughs> every temple should have guards. Every Jewish school better be protected. Because um, I, I think that if, you know, they're sleeper cells, or they're not even sleeper cells, they're just one-offs. But the law of large numbers tells you if there are a, hundred, a million and a half gotaways, all you need is a hundred, and you could have real problems in the United States. So I think that you're absolutely right, and I agree that in this case, Israel just should not, should just do it quickly and efficiently. I mean, rip the Band-Aid off. If you're, go get Hamas, get the bad guys, get the leadership, get the arms depots, get the military leadership, and then, and then, and then I'm not sure what then happens. Maybe the UN goes in and it makes it an occupied UN area. Um, I was reading somewhere where somebody from the State Department said, well, if Israel does this, then Israel has to, oh, he was the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas. Uh, I went to grad school with him. Um, and he said, well, if Israel's going to do this, Israel must come up with a plan for um, Gaza to become a vibrant and self-sustaining economy after they leave. And all I could think of was in 2000 and five and six. So Israel was occupied, had occupied Gaza after the 67 war and occupied it and actually was, you know, it wasn't so bad. And Israel at the time, and Alan and I met these, some of these guys um, when we were in Israel on one trip or another, and they were, uh, Gaza had some great um, greenhouses. They were growing heirloom tomatoes, they were growing all sorts of agricultural products that then they were selling to Europe. And when the Israelis moved out, Ariel Sharon moved them out, and then you know, they, the, guys who owned, the Jewish guys who owned the greenhouses, they couldn't sell them to anybody, right? Nobody was going to buy them. So they left them intact because they thought, well, this would be really good for the Palestinian people in Gaza because it would be a built-in, you already got the food chain going, you've already got the trade agreement, just grow some more heirloom tomatoes. And just, you know what they did? They blew them up. <laughs> the, the, the Hamas said, 
If Israel built them, we don't want them. And so they blew up the greenhouses. So you tell me of, of how anybody is going to say to the people, to, even if Hamas is gone, well, we're going to help you be a vibrant and, and thriving economy. I, I just don't see it. We have time for one more question. Okay. Anybody who can grab a mic? Oh, thank you. We'll do you next. We'll do two more. Okay, quick question. I'll give you a quick answer. Thank you Sir. for all your great service that you've given you. to the country. Uh, as you've described the foreign policy coming out of Washington these last few years, it seems moronic. Or what? Moronic. Moronic? Yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, I mean, this is not rocket science. No, it's not. <laughs> Is there a hidden motivation behind it or oh. agenda that I can Are they really trying see? to bring down America kind of thing? No, I don't understand it. Here's the thing. I, I mean, it, it, I've been trying to figure this out myself because, you know, look, I'm a traitor to my... I, I went to all these colleges. I'm better qualified than most of these guys. I really honestly think that it, the, the real heart of a problem of a big spending liberal is he never thinks about the consequences of his actions. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe he got the participation trophy and he didn't realize that you had to work really hard to win. Whatever it is, but they never see the consequences of their actions. So they don't see the consequence of the uh, Biden's new Green Deal, right, the Inflation Recovery Act. It really should be named the Chinese Prosperity Act because where are you going to buy all this Green New Deal stuff? It comes from China. So I don't think they're smart and sneaky enough. I think some of them might be. The Mali might be. But I think most of them, just they just think, I'm going to throw money at it. Um, it's going to solve the problem, and I think they never foresee the consequences of their action. They never foresaw that if you stopped American energy production, you would make Iran rich and dangerous and Russia rich and dangerous. And one more, the guy who was jumping up over there, you got to ask a question. The man over here. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it was quite an eye-opener, and you kind of laid out a, a multidimensional chess match of foreign policy. And we have an administration, a Congress, and a House of Representatives that don't seem to be able to get their act together. How do we expect as a country to be able to manage that multi-dimensional chess match and bring all this together to bring down these bad actors? I don't see it. OK, so what I didn't say, Michelle alluded to it, but when I left the Trump administration, I was just persecuted by the Mueller people. In fact, the guy who was running the Mueller investigation said, if we can get KT McFarland, if we can break her, she's a really smart one, we'll get them all. And so they really, they you know, subpoenaed me, legal f bills are hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they wanted me to say that I'd done something wrong, and I didn't, I'd never done anything wrong. I mean, come on, I've, I've been doing this for 50 years, I, I didn't do anything wrong. But they really wanted to find me to have done something wrong. And then when it was pretty clear that I wasn't going to break, but they kept subpoenaing me. I, Alan and I had a really hard night when we sat with our lawyers, the head of Sullivan and Cromwell was my lawyer, Bob Jiffra, whose name, by the way, is on the staircase as one of the founders of, of the Reagan um, Center. He said, they want you to plead, they want you to say that you committed perjury and you lied. And I said, but I didn't. And he said, I know, but they want you to do it. And so I said to Alan, you know, come on, I mean, we're comfortable, but nobody's going to be able to spend millions of dollars defending themselves. By the way, you never get it reimbursed. Um, you have to pay your own, you have to prove you're innocent on your own dime. And so Alan said, you'll never live with yourself if you plead guilty. And so, I, okay, so I said to my lawyer, Bob Jeffer, whose name is right out there, a man of great courage, and I, and I said, no, I'm not going to plead guilty. I'm not going to say I did anything wrong, and I'm not going to finger President Trump, which is what they wanted me to do, to say Trump had done all these things which he hadn't done. And so when, and I was the only person who didn't, didn't break. And I said no, and then at that point, they said, oh, okay, well, we're going off to porn stars. We'll go find Donald Trump guilty of something else. And so Alan and I, he, he said, grab your passport. We got on a flight that night. We flew from, Gla we flew from, J uh, from Newark to Glasgow on the west coast of Scotland. We rented a car, we drove to the furthest west coast, and we got on a ferry. And then we went, for hours on the ferry. We went to these Hebridean islands where there are very few people, lots of scotch, lots of sheep and goats, and no roads, <laughs> no Wi-Fi, no TV, no cell phone, no nothing. And so I, Alan said, you got to get your feet under yourself again. you got to pull yourself together. 
And so I walked in the rain, and, and, I, and I thought, oh, my career's over, my life is over, but my integrity's intact. And then I started thinking, well, America's all screwed up. Is this the worst we've ever had? Everyone thinks this is, we'll never recover from this, we'll never. And then I started thinking, because I'd spent a lot of time studying American history, and I thought, wait a minute, we have been, it's been worse than this. Maybe not for me personally, but it's been worse. And then I, I developed this thing, which is in my brilliant book, which is what I call the 40-year theory. So every 40 years, Americans throw, overthrow the ruling class because it isn't getting the job done. Whether it was in 1776 and we overthrew the king, whether, and then we got a new group of leaders, and everything was great for a while. And then about 40 years later, you know, the leadership class and people in power always will do anything to stay in power. But by then, the country had changed. So then we had the Jacksonian Revolution in the 1830s. We got rid of those old guys who were in power, and we had new guys. And that worked out just fine until about the Civil War. And our people in Washington weren't getting it. They couldn't figure out how to govern us anymore. And so it keeps going. Every 40 years, we go through one of these. Reagan came through one of these. You know, before Reagan, you probably, none of you are probably old enough to remember, but John Kenneth Galbraith, Nobel Prize a Nobel laureate for economics said, well, the Soviet Union's economy was far better than ours. And people were assuming that the United States was finished. It was going to be the Soviet Union. And there was such division in the United States. There was the same kind of division that we had during the Civil War, except we weren't fighting with guns. But I think what I concluded was that America goes through these periods of enormous destruction. But it's a creative destruction. And that we do that because we change. This society changes and how we make our living, where we live, the demographics, the eth the eth I mean, we're not only that we're a melting pot of a lot of different you know, nationalities from around the world, but we change. And I think the founding fathers and their genius understood that we needed to have revolutions every now and then, but we don't want to have violent revolutions. We would do it at the ballot box. And so... At the, end of the, at the end of the time with me and Alan and the sheep and the rain and the scotch and the no roads and no Wi-Fi, um, I concluded that, in fact, that probably is the essence of American greatness. We reinvent ourselves. I mean, I've, looked, I've talked to some of you. You're all very successful. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be able to donate to this great place unless you had, had done pretty well in life. But you've all probably done it on your own. You're all probably self-made. Put yourself through college, build up a business. But America does that. You reinvented yourself. We reinvent ourselves as a nation. So when I look at the dysfunction, and you're right, it is a lot of dysfunction, I am confident that we will come out of it the same way who would have thought Ronald Reagan could unite the nation and win the Cold War and fix the American economy? Cowboy, right? Second-rate actor, and he did it. We have found these leaders somehow, somewhere, from the most unexpected places, and yet they seem to show up. Now, do I know how it's going to happen or who it is who's going to? I don't. But I think I've counted seven times we've done this. And we've, every time we've emerged, we have become a better society, a more cohesive society, a more successful, a more just society. So I think what we're going through now, this does, these revolutions don't happen in one election. It took Andrew Jackson three elections. But we end up doing it. And I think that we'll get there. I hope I live long enough to see it. But I do believe that that is, in fact, the essence of American greatness. No other country does this. Other countries, they have rise, they shine, they have their and then they decline. You know, Portugal, the empire, France, the empire, Spain, the empire, Soviet Union, Japan, they'd be all these empires, they crash. But we, you know, we rise, we shine, we decline a little, fight it all out, and then we rise again. So. I don't know how it happens. I hope some of these young women in this room are part of it. But I do believe that we will find our way out of this darkness. Thank you. Just a, a, a few uh, quick things as we conclude our evening together. Um, and uh, Katie, I'm so glad you ended on a, on a hopeful note uh, after a very sobering discussion. Um, 
uh, we, we, we knew uh, going into this uh, that uh, you were the person to hear from uh, right now in these circumstances, and you proved that uh, correct. So thank you again for all that you've done through so many years of service to our country uh, and for sharing your insights with us tonight. I can guarantee every single person in this room is going to look at the world a little bit differently through the lens that you gave us this evening. So thank you. Um, We, uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm sure we all want to know too. Where, where were your notes? <laughs> um, the uh, no, that made it made it all the more impressive. Um, one of the things I thought you brilliantly outlined. I mean, we, we all need to be praying for Israel uh, first and foremost, uh, and, and what is happening there in that part of the world. Uh, but this is a, a battle on the front lines uh, with weapons. It's a battle of ideas. Uh, and we are in the process of developing plans for our students to <coughs> uh, uh, do th their part in standing for Israel um, and countering the, just the horrific complicity of uh, young people who have been lied to for years and years uh, who are not equipped to understand uh, these issues. So this is a, a graphic that's going to be, uh, you'll see a lot of, um, pray for our students too who are, who are doing this. Uh, we had a, uh, yeah, excuse me, a, a young man, Alejandro, uh, who's a, a colleague, a member of our team, who was uh, attacked on campus um, just this morning. Uh, he was actually at uh, the University of Kentucky uh, filming a leftist ripping down uh, 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 flyers for a Matt Walsh event that's taking place on campus. Uh, and all he was doing was asking questions. And uh, of course, the leftists couldn't answer those questions. And so he did what many leftists do. He resorted to violence. Um, and so Alejandro to the hospital. Alejandro is fine. Uh, he's a brave young man. He'll, he'll survive this. But it is a vicious battle on, uh, on many fronts. Um, so thank you for outlining that uh, so well for us this evening. Um, the, uh, uh, Michelle, thank you for your leadership, for uh, your work in putting together the Western Women's Summit this weekend, uh, for what you have done uh, for so many years. Um, and uh, if you're here with us uh, at the center for the first time, whether it's a supporter of uh, uh, Claire Booth Luce, uh Center for Conservative Women, or a student uh, in the Western Women's Summit, uh, I hope you were inspired by that program. I hope we see more of you here uh, at the Reagan Ranch Center for future uh, YAF events. Um, and then uh, if you're interested in learning more about the roundtable program that's taking place uh, next week at the Hilton during our high school conference, our fall high school conference, uh, talk to me or a member of our team. And as Kenner Freedom had a uh, vibrant, impressive 10-year career in the NBA, uh, which was really snatched from him because he increasingly spoke boldly uh, about uh, politically incorrect issues that you're not supposed to talk about as a uh, professional athlete, including the NBA's complicity with, uh, with China. Um, so I think you're going to want to hear from him uh, next week, and I think we do still have space available for that program, along with the uh, 150 high school students that will be coming uh, from all over the country. Uh, I've gotten through the whole evening without uh, referencing a, a Reagan quote, so I'm going to end with one. I uh, can't let that uh, happen. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan gave Claire Booth Luce uh, the Medal of Freedom in 1983 at the White House. He was a great admirer of uh, hers and all that she had accomplished. Um, at the ceremony, he said this, Claire Booth Luce has served and enriched her country in many fields. Her brilliance of mind, gracious warmth, and great fortitude have propelled her to exceptional heights of accomplishment. She has earned the respect of people all over the world and the love of her fellow Americans. Michelle, I'm confident that uh, your namesake would be proud of the way you're continuing that legacy. I encourage all of us, particularly the young women in this room, to carry that legacy forward. Thank you. Thank you.